my upbringing, that's an interesting one. Okay, so I was born and raised in London, uh, the seven of us, large family. We don't have anybody here, my family from Bangladesh. Uh -huh. uh, my father passed away when I was quite young, I was 17, mm -hmm. and he was the only one that supported education, mm -hmm. whereas my mum was the complete opposite. Okay. So when my dad passed away at 17, mm -hmm. my mum's priority was to try to get me married off. And with family pressure, societal pressure, that was the easiest thing for her to kind of champion. Okay. So for me to go on to further and higher education, it wasn't a priority at all. If anything, back in those days when I was going to universities, it was unheard of. Nobody in my area mm. in East London um, went to university, none of the boys or the girls. Oh, really? Okay. So for me to say um, two years after my dad passed away that I, I'm going to go to university mm. was a big shock yeah. to the system, to and a lot of people. Is it true that um, you had brothers, you were the eldest? Are you? So I'm the eldest sister, oh, yeah, but I've got four older brothers. Okay, right. So not, whereas none of my brothers went to university, oh, none of them did. Okay. And for me to come up and yeah, say, actually, yeah. I want to do oh, this, okay, no. I was pushing the boundaries, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. When I, my upbringing was quite conservative. Um, you weren't allowed to question things. I, I suppose that was quite common during those times. I had to, eventually, when I did go to university, I had to kind of get that funding myself. Okay. Where I took a year after college because nobody would give me the money. And that's the year when Blair came into power and yeah. abolished grants and funding. So I had to take a year out and I literally worked four jobs just trying to make ends meet and to get enough to pay the first instalment on back then was £1,300, which yeah. doesn't sound like a lot today, but it was the equivalent of £9,000 as it is today. Yeah, so know. it was hard work. So eventually when I started to go to university, I had to leave home. And it's not something that you do as an unmarried Muslim girl living in East London do. When I left home, I had to move into the hostels, mm. and that's really when my journey kind of started. Okay. So when, when I upbringing was good, when dad was around, but then when dad passed away, it became a lot more difficult, especially for mum because she had six unmarried children, yeah. uh, a young widow. So uh, it was hard for mum. Yeah. Um, she didn't understand why I was passionate about education. Mm. But for me, education was important because dad was an advocate of education. Yeah. What that meant was I always saw education as my exit route. It sounds a bit negative, but it was, I see it as a positive because that's what always has driven me to get my education mm. above and beyond anybody, knowing that nobody else in the area has gone through that path. So you, you saw it as, I mean, apart from your father really encouraging mm -hmm. you, what was it that made you want to be different from what everyone else around you had, uh, had done? Um, really? I've always been called a black sheep in my family. So I always kept thinking outside the box. I always believed there was more to life. And I, you're going to probably hate me for saying this, but then being chained to the sink and cooking, having 10 kids by the time you hit 30, yeah. I thought there was more to life than that. I never saw any women in my community contributing to society. Yeah. And I just didn't understand yeah. why that was. So my dad, again, my dad was the one who's always been helping people in the community. Okay. And I kept thinking, my dad used to take me everywhere, whether he's translating, whether uh, he's filling out forms, yeah. those things that we take for granted today, but yeah. people back then didn't know it. English and didn't know how to fill out the form yeah. because dad did it mm. that's what inspired me and I think that was the seed that was planted. So you had that link between education mm -hmm. and serving the community yes. isn't it? That's maybe what the drive came where the drive I believe came so from. because yeah. I, I, don't, I didn't understand why people kept talking the talk yeah. but not walking the walk. And were you ever comparing yourself to people outside of the Muslim community and saying well they're getting on with it why aren't we? At that, at that time no I'll be no, honest with okay. you because my worldview was very yeah. limited. Yeah, that was your worldview. That was my worldview because of, I suppose, the sheltered life that I had, yeah. that you would do bring the eldest daughter out of seven, mm. or seven of us siblings in total, and mum was very protective, dad was also very protective. And because of that, my worldview was just the community that I lived in. Yeah. So I didn't have any role models per se, yeah. except for my dad, so. Wow, that's quite, because usually I think, uh, what I was, we were talking to a guest yesterday mm -hmm. and they said that uh, one of the ways that one of the driving factors for them mm -hmm. was uh, role models they mm -hmm. had. But for you, it seems like it just it purely came out of um, the seed of kind of looking around and just reflecting mm -hmm. on, on what's what's not working and stuff. Really. And, and perhaps your father as well. Played a massive I mean, role. it was a really primitive view of how somebody should help somebody. But obviously, as I grew older, yeah. I understood that to me and I learned the hard way that yeah. helping others can come in a variety of different mm. ways and I learned that through my entire journeys till this point.